Okay, let's get started. Um, the class is starting at 11, uh, not 1 o'clock, which I think a lot of people are still confused about. Uh, but I'm sure we'll get, the, uh, we'll get everything in order as time progresses. Um, this is lecture two um, for this particular class, um, although it really is lecture one in terms of the class content. Um, last week, if you missed it, talk to me after class. I think all of you were actually here from the people I can recognize. And uh, we, I, I just went over an overview of the syllabus, overview of the assignments, overview of the class. Um, so tonight, today is actually the, the real first lecture of the course. And it is the PowerPoint slide set lecture two, uh, competing with information technology, uh, why study strategic management of information technology, you know, the name of the course. Um, so this is really an overview um, of, a lot, of a lot of the topics and can kind of think of it as the outline in some different ways. Uh, but talking about the strategic advantage that information technology can add to almost any business. And um, as I mentioned last week, we don't have a textbook for the course. Um, instead, what I've done is I've pulled lectures and I've pulled information from a variety of different sources. Uh, one of them being what you're looking at here on this slide. Uh, this particular lecture is based on a book uh, by James O'Brien and George Maracas, if I've said that correctly. And uh, the book's titled Management Information Systems. And I put the ISBN number up here, just in case you're interested. And uh, what I'm doing is essentially giving you a lot of information from a lot of different sources, putting it all together. There really is no one, in my opinion, there really is no one good source for strategic management of information technology. You can't talk about information technology without talking about information systems. You can't, you know, and vice versa. So it's kind of like um, I almost have to pull from a lot of different sources to make this actually worthwhile. Um, there's a URL down in the bottom where you can actually see um, some of the author's uh, PowerPoints as well for his particular text. This is not the full chapter two, competing with technologies. There's bits and pieces of it that kind of work with the strategic management stuff. Um, so if you're looking for uh, some reading material, you're that eager, um, you can definitely find this as being a really good source. So what I'm going to talk about today is identifying several basic competitive strategies, talk about competitive strategies and how it works with information technology, explain the use of some of these technologies to develop the strategy, and now uh, look at competitive forces you know, faced by business situations, business scenarios that are happening today. Um, it used to be, uh, you know, in the old days, if you did something with technology, you were being front, you were front edge, you're cutting edge, I should say. Now, if you don't do it, you're behind the times. It's almost automatically assumed if you're going to run a business in the U.S. that you're going to use technology to help that business. Um, if you don't, you're not going to be able to run the business. Um, so, the kind of the old traditional mom and pop shop, you know, like opening up the little for sale sign, throwing the blanket out on the ground with your products out there. And you actually you still see them, you know, when you go to shows, trade shows, or you go to fairs, excuse me, uh, like downtown festivals and things. You see like the jewelry and the handcrafts and stuff. Uh, but, you know, really, does someone really make their, well, I guess people do really make their living that way. Uh, but if you're going to try and be like, make a lot of money and actually try to support a family on it, if it doesn't work. so. Neither does opening up a store and relying upon walk-in sales. That doesn't work either. <laughs> so nowadays, in order to even uh, you know make the cost of living here uh, in the United States, it's it's going to definitely be uh, a challenge. Um, so anyway, what ends up happening to most businesses is they have to actually kind of think outside the box a little bit and start you know understanding how to use technology to make that business successful, uh, to give yourself the best, uh, the best chances of success. So we'll also look at several strategies using internet technologies. When I talk about IT, you know, for most businesses, the internet is the main component. Um, in fact, for most everything we're doing these days, the internet plays a huge part. So we have to basically know how to use it and take advantage of what it has to offer and give you uh, some advantages and maybe some also some disadvantages. So. You know, take, take a look at a lot of different types of things and also look at some examples of how businesses have been able to re-engineer themselves. Take a look at how the business tasks can be um, improved. Um, and this is kind of builds on, if you've taken my MIS course, Management Information Systems, and talk a lot about business processes, business process re-engineering, and using information systems to kind of help support the work effort. 
in this particular class, we're going to focus more on the technology aspect of it. Um, but it is a huge part of doing business. I mean, people go to work every day. They have jobs that they're doing. They have work assigned to them, tasks that they're performing. Um, you have to use technology these days. Um, if you rely on old manual labor, again, it's just kind of like throwing out a blanket and put some jewelry on it. <laughs> You're not going to be able to compete, especially with people on eBay who are selling them you know, every second. They got 10 sales coming through. Um, so anyway, uh, re-engineering is another topic, identifying the value, the business value of using the internet and internet technologies as well. And, uh, and then also looking at and identifying how to become agile in terms of an agile competitor and how to form a virtual company um, and how to use technology to give you a company image. In fact, that brings up a really good point. You know, talking about throwing out a blanket and putting some jewelry on it. <laughs> That was done maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago. It's still being done today. But now people just, you know, purchase some web space for $9.95 a year, throw up a website. There you go, you're in business. It's kind of the equivalent, but it's kind of a, also, you know, shows you a sign of the times, you know, with technology. We're doing the same thing, it's the same concept. So business is business. Um, and then, you know, as technology grows, you know, it's like you have to adapt, otherwise you can't, <laughs> you can't survive. In fact, you know, in the old days, if you had a website, when the internet was first kind of becoming well used and in kind of the public focus, people thought you didn't exist. Oh, you're on the internet? Oh, and that's not real, that's a hoax. That, you know, those guys are, you know, they're, they're fake. Now it's the opposite. Now if you're not on the internet and they can't find you on the internet, you, oh, that's a hoax. You know, you guys don't, you don't, you don't exist. Even if you've been in a building for 20 years and you don't have a website, you know, you're, you're kind of, you missed the boat, actually, is what happened to you. You're off the wagon, I guess. Or so, I don't know. All right, also explaining how knowledge management systems can help businesses gain strategic advantages as well. And um, if you were in my MIS class, I talked a lot about knowledge management, knowledge engineering. This is kind of an extension of that and how to use technology to develop knowledge and, uh, and actually to grow the information concept. Because we know information is information that's built from data plus data. And that data plus more data gives us information. Information plus more information gives us knowledge. Knowledge plus more knowledge gives us wisdom. I don't think we can get any higher than wisdom. I don't know. I haven't gotten any higher than wisdom myself, so I don't know. Uh, all right, so why study strategic IT? A question of today, which is really kind of the lecture one material, essentially, that I gave you last week. So just to review, you know, technology is no longer an afterthought in forming a business strategy. Uh, it's actually the cause and the driver of the business. If you think about so many businesses that have come into existence, and it's probably not a bad idea to start talking about what the difference is between a business and what's referred to as an e-business. Uh, because you've got a few choices when you open a business. For the entrepreneurial people, you can open up you know, a traditional style business. Or you can go the e-business route, which is actually kind of different. The old, long, long, long time ago, the a real kind of beginning definition of it had it tied with e-commerce and say, well, an e-business, well, they do e-commerce. If you think about it, then every business is an e-business. <laughs> After what I just said about having to be on the internet, you know, otherwise you don't exist, you know, using technology. Well, then that requires everybody to be an e-business, but not everybody is an e-business. Uh, so if you want to talk about e-businesses, it's not a bad side note, not on the slide set, but just kind of as a kind of an FYI. My personal definition of that is it's a business that doesn't exist in the real world. And as an example of that, let's take a comparison between Amazon. We all know about Amazon. If, you, if you're a student, you buy books, Amazon, and then Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble is a traditional business. In fact, if you go to any Barnes & Noble, there's stores. You can walk in. And people actually still buy books at the stores. In fact, it's a great place. They have a free internet access now. Well, Starbucks has got free internet access. You usually see Barnes & Noble's kind of mixed in with a Noah's Bagels and a Starbucks, usually, on the same center. Maybe sometimes over the same roof. You walk in, you spend a couple hours. If you're a nerdy type, you know, that's entertainment for you. You find some books, you know. You sit there, you study, do stuff like that. You can't do that with Amazon. Uh, Amazon doesn't have a real store that you can walk into. In fact, 
<laughs> Amazon has warehouses where they actually stock stuff that comes from publishers. Uh, Barnes & Noble actually doesn't have any warehouses. <laughs> they have stores and they drop ship everything. So when you buy something from a Barnes & Noble, it generally comes directly from a publisher to a customer through like this wall called Barnes & Noble and that handles the transaction using e-commerce you know, as, a, as a, the buzzword for it. Amazon, similar. However, they actually have warehouses full of stuff and they have a couple of different components. As an example, everyone's aware you can buy used books at Amazon. Actually, you can buy more than just books at Amazon. You can buy stereo equipment. <laughs> you can buy everything, practically. It's almost like a little eBay, if you think about it. They, ha they have their own little consumer-to-consumer -consumer portal aspect of it as well. And they have actually branched down into a couple of other areas as well. Uh, but long story short, you can't walk into an Amazon store and buy somebody's used stereo equipment. <laughs> not only is it not there, but it's just impossible because it's all electronic. The business itself runs on an e-business platform or e-business model, completely electronic. Barnes & Noble, no, that's a traditional business. They actually have stores. So if you, if you break it down, you just, you know, ask yourself the question, if the internet were to go down, would the company exist? If the company's not going to exist without the internet, and that has heavy reliance, and then they're an e-business. If they would still exist, they would still function just fine, then they're a real business. They're a traditional style business. And then I was like, you know, when I explained this, and I was like, well, what about eBay? eBay's an e-business. PayPal, owned by eBay. E-business. So Macy's, real business, real traditional, not e-business, but they all sell stuff online. Um, department store, everybody sells stuff online. So they participate in e-commerce anyway. So I think I have uh, killed that one as much as possible, <laughs> beaten that one down. But you know, still at the end, I, you know, sometimes on a midterm, I say, you know, give me an example of an e-business. <laughs> give me an example of a, a real business. And students say, you know, it's like, they don't know the difference for some reason. Uh, but that's actually kind of a typical question I like to just to throw out there to see if anyone's been listening to me all term. Uh, but yeah. So how IT can also, uh, well, IT can change the way businesses compete. Because um, we're, you know, we're focusing on the strategic advantage that IT provides. When you talk about strategic advantage, you've got to break it out into a couple different categories. You know, the first and utmost importance is revenue, I would hope. If you don't, if you can't think of that and it doesn't make any sense to you, then you shouldn't be an MBA student <laughs> because the world revolves around money, sorry to say. <laughs> so, revenue. And how are you going to get revenue? You're going to compete. So, you're either going to implement IT to give yourself a competitive advantage. You're going to implement it maybe to make yourself more effective. Because if it's not revenue you're focused on, then it's cost savings. So, why are we spending so much money for customer service people? You know, why do we have a warehouse this big? You know, your fixed assets, your operating expenses are too high. You can use information technology to lower those expenses. Another way that you can strategically implement information technology would also be to introduce a new product or service to your existing business. A classic example of that is what Federal Express did. And that's actually, I'm jumping ahead. So what I'm saying now, when we get to it, I don't have to cover it. I've already covered it. So, <laughs> but I like to talk ahead because uh, it makes more sense to put it all together in the beginning. Um, but anyway, long story short, so Federal Express, you know, actually all of the shipping companies today, you can't run a shipping company without having online tracking and online uh, services. So you can print, you know, log into uh, their website. In fact, even the U.S. Postal Service does this now. Print labels out. You know, do your own print and ship kind of thing. In fact, um, it makes it easier for the consumer, faster, more convenient, cheaper. Because you don't, you're not using Federal Express or even United States Postal Service employees. You're, you're doing your own effort. You're printing your own label. You're using your own paper. In fact, most of the time, you're using your own boxes, too. And uh, so there's no labor. Uh, and you can actually process a lot more of those transactions. Yes? Disadvantages? In that example I just gave you, there's a huge one. 
There's no one checking you to see if you've done it correctly. <laughs> In fact, I can't tell you how many times I've printed out the wrong label. You know, I've printed out something for a large size box when I'm putting it on a small one. So I'm paying more, you know, from a consumer's perspective. Uh, to jump way far ahead in a totally separate lecture that's going to happen a couple weeks down the road, I can tell you one of the one big huge advantage of using technology is whatever you invent, your competitor is going to copy you and probably do it better. Because <laughs> you're going to make the initial investment, spend all the money and do all the research. They're going to take a look at that and go, oh, I can do that. After you've already figured it out, they're going to copy you. Because the one problem with technology is it's highly exposed. You can't hide what you're doing, for the most part. I mean, you can copyright and have, you, know, you have your own intellectual property in terms of your technology. But it's really easy to tell that you're using some sort of an electronic signature or you're using some sort of a service or you're using... So yeah, one of the biggest disadvantages for companies, and I would say it's the first one on the block to do it. <laughs> But that happens in the real world anyway, in the business, the traditional business world. The guy who comes out with the product first isn't the guy that makes the most money. <laughs> it's the second and thirds that come out that do a better job. And uh, actually it's kind of like, I hate to go back to an Apple example, but it's kind of like that iPod. They weren't the first MP3 players on the market. <laughs> but they actually are the pretty much the leaders right now. So, you know, even set-top boxes, all your new, you know, your cell phone, everything had people that came up with these ideas that, you know, brought it to the market, but they're not the ones that made the most money on it because somebody stole their idea. And you know what? I shouldn't say steal their idea either. It's a free market economy. They are taking advantage of something that someone's already, you know, had sweated, sweated over to, to build and to discover and to figure out. But if you think about it, that's how the economy grows. You know, we wouldn't have all the really good products that we have right now if people didn't take advantage of what somebody else learned, somebody else did. So. But that's actually a theme for a lecture I'm going to have in about three or four weeks. After I tell you all the good stuff about and all the strategic advantages, then I'm going to hit the disadvantages and all the problems that this poses and comes into. And I'll talk about the legal system at that point as well. So, oops. All right, uh, unless there are any other questions, back to the, and hopefully I answered that question, who knows. But anyway, <laughs> I think I probably did. I don't know. All right, so IT can also change the way businesses compete. Um, the strategic view of information systems. Uh, one thing that the Internet brought to us was information upon information upon information. And, uh, actually, I don't know if I actually even finished my example about FedEx and the shipping, but... Um, just as a side note to go back to finish that example, it has revolution. what FedEx did actually revolutionized package handling all over the world. And uh, they basically introduced a new service, a new product. So they used information technology to give themselves something they didn't have, which is more levels of service, different qualities, different delivery times. Now we have morning, mid-morning, late afternoon, uh, evening. I don't know exactly how many different times of day we can schedule something to arrive. But if they can track it, then they can guarantee it. And if they can actually manage their business better, then they can offer those products and services and stuff like that, um, which is kind of like what PayPal did for eBay and then eventually became part of eBay. You know, people are afraid to use credit cards online. So PayPal exists solely to give people peace of mind when they do an electronic transaction. And if you integrate it into an e-commerce engine, you know, the eBay, then you got the best of both worlds because you got buying and then you've got paying for it and you've got shipping it. Also, there's shipping modules that are integrated into it. You have everything all in housed in one safe, well, presumably safe environment for people to work in. Um, and I'll go through other, an entire list of other strategic advantages that information technology provides businesses from all sorts of different characteristics or all sorts of different reasons. So there's many different ways of thinking about it. All right, so information. So the big information superhighway, <laughs> the WWW, World Wide Web, the Internet as we know it, 
uh, means organizational renewal sometimes, being able to take something and add new meaning to it. Um, in my information systems class, I start out by talking about how, and I just went through the formulas for you, data plus data and information. Anyway, long story short, you collect it. You collect it for a while, you put it into a database, which is why database systems are so popular for businesses these days. And then once you have the database, then it's like, well, what do we do with it now? <laughs> you come up with new products and services that are based on the data. You could. You could use the data or that information to figure out, you know, last year around Christmas time, we built 100 of these items, and we sold all of them within the first day. And then the year before that, we had 500 of them, and we had 200 of them left over. Okay, that means we need to, you know, 300 of them or 400 of them. See, you can actually use the data that's collected to give you statistics, which is how all the statistical packages come into play in a lot of business communities, so that you can figure out how to run your business better. You know, what order quantities should you make? What kind of ship, what, what quality of service are you providing? How many of your customers are coming back and buying multiple products if you're keeping track of customer information? How many of those customers call in for support? How long do they wait? Car companies have been doing this for years, and they actually have you tracked to the point where they know how many miles you've got on your car sometimes. Especially as an example, well, not to, not to advertise, but the, the whole thing with BMW, the two years of free scheduled maintenance, and then they keep track of you, and they give you, well, you paid for it ahead of time when you bought the car. But every time you come in, you look at the newer models. They have you, you're housed with correct information in their database. They can send you flyers, promos, information about your scheduled service. You're going to the dealership whether you like it or not, because you're getting free service <laughs> that you've already paid for when you, when you bought the car. <laughs> but because you, they tack on a little bit extra for that free service, which really isn't that free. And uh, because what ends up happening is I've done some studies on it, and I've determined that uh, a good percentage of those free service appointments uh, turn into sales, cross sale, up sale, sides. You know, oh, you need seat covers. Oh, you need this. Oh, you need that. Window tinting. You know, all the oh, you know, car wash detailing services. They sell you on almost everything. And uh, people, you know, will, you know, will actually go for it. Well, it's not like an intrusive telephone solicitor calling you at dinner time while you're trying to enjoy your food to sell you a new cell phone plan. You know, instead, you're going to them. You're more apt to actually get a new car every two years at, when your service is over with. Oh, my service is over with. Yeah, you know, the mechanic's telling you, oh, yeah, you know what? You only got a couple more years left. Maybe you should trade it in or something, you know, so it's a sales ploy. Uh, but the information that they're housing on you, what problems you've had with the car, so is helping them through a customer relationship management program, helping them mine you in terms of data mining or manage you, you know, depending upon how you want to think about it. So, so information systems are necessary investments in technology. Um, you can adopt strategies using information systems. Uh, business processes can change. You can enable or re-engineer or reinvent yourself so you can survive in today's dynamic environment. And what do you mean by that? Well, if you're running a grocery store, you got to have point-of-sale systems that do some sort of infrared barcode scanning. If you're running a warehouse, you got to do inventory control somehow automated. You can't spend weeks months. Actually, in the old days when you did physical count, it took like what, like maybe sometimes the entire month of January if you're going to try and close your books out at the end of the month, at end of the year. Now with all the barcode stuff, in fact, now they have infrareds on boxes and stuff. You go through the warehouse, you wave a wand down the aisle, <laughs> and it tells you how many you've got of everything on that shelf, which, you know, to, to hire someone to go count those items, it's going to be way too time consuming. You know, uh, you know, how many people can you check out at the grocery, you know, how, how many people can be checked out within the hour? It's basically, the bottom line is how many sales can you make? Um, and then can you give the option for people to buy it online? You know, stuff like that. So reinventing yourself uh, could be a matter of figuring out your business isn't doing well. You, uh, you know, what business actually stays profitable for its entire lifetime? 
eventually somebody else is going to open up next door and provide better customer service or they're going to be faster or they're going to have better looking products or something. Um, so you can actually use information systems and technologies to give yourself a facelift as a business. And I don't mean putting up a brand new website, which is the common misperception. You see this all the time, actually. You see, you know, you go to, oh, wow, I went to the website a year ago. You go to now and you look at the website. Oh, look, new color combination. Look, new pictures. That doesn't actually give the business a facelift. <laughs> it makes them look better. That makes their website look better. Actually, sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes, you know, what is familiar to somebody is a bonus. And if you're already from, I hate it when you go into something, and if you've noticed, eBay hasn't changed. eBay, that format will stay the same for the next 20 years. Why? Because I know how to use it. I'm familiar with it. And I'm actually not even a big eBay customer. Or, I, you know, I go through my garage occasionally and get rid of junk on eBay. But, long story, I get one item a month, maybe, or something at the most. But when I go in, I remember what it looked like. I remember where everything is. I know how to check my messages and stuff. If you think you're giving your company a facelift by adding some new color, rearranging the whole design, you know, de you know, hiring a web developer to come in to give your company a facelift, what you're doing is sabotaging everybody who used to know you <laughs> and making it more difficult for them to do business with you. Because they go to your site, where is everything? Last time I was here, oh, they're not going to bother. The time and effort that most consumers invest in learning your website is maybe two seconds. I think it was used to, so somebody wrote a book called The Five Second Rule, meaning if you can't find what you're looking for within five seconds, you close the website. Most consumers would hit the back button, go somewhere else. It's like the five second rule, which means it's got to be clear enough. And then there's the three click rule. If it takes you longer than three clicks to get to something, consumers won't bother. If you always, actually, if you notice, most software is following the three click rule. You know, it's always file, open, you know, pick the file name. Or file, save, put the file name in there. Or, you know, it's always a series of threes. Because most people can remember three. You know, it's like remembering telephone numbers with three digits, four digits. You know. Well, four is a challenge, but three works for most people. So, anyway, there's rules and strategies. And if you follow the strategies, you have better luck than if you go and you put more pictures <laughs> on the website or more graphics or you decide oh we need to use Dreamweaver or we need to use Flash everybody's using Flash you know we have to give ourselves a company facelift so that we can look better look like everybody else well that's the problem you don't want to look like everybody else it's kind of like if, if you were and in fact don't you know, actually I'm not ready to talk about that slide yet um, if you were to think about what people's behavior, company behavior is in terms of how they update their websites, it totally contradicts traditional business philosophy. Everybody wants to look like everybody else <laughs> on the internet. And they, in fact, well, some, people, some scammers make a living doing this, but impersonating other people. <laughs> but the legitimate people, they all try to use like, you know, flash video here, drop down menus, you know, it's all copying everybody else and making you look, you know, quote unquote professional. And uh, what ends up standing out are the unique people in a lot of different ways. So it's, you know, I don't know, if all companies built the same products, you know, that wouldn't make any sense either. So, anyway, that's a long story. <clears throat> anyway, so the book that I gave you the reference for in the beginning has a series of case studies. The slide set's going to go through not the whole case. In fact, I'm just going to talk about a little bit in terms of what came out of it. And at the end, and the slide set's about 60 slides long, but don't worry about it. Half of it's questions that you don't have to answer. But it's stuff you should think about in terms of um, you know, trying to understand you know, why did that something happen a certain way? Why is something a certain way? Which kind of makes you wonder sometimes, makes you think a little bit. And case number one kind of gets in the concept of does technology really matter? And uh, that one actually kind of explained already in terms of, uh, and the answer to that question is, you know, yeah. <laughs> the IT <laughs> does matter. <laughs> I mean, you can't, you can't compete without it these days. Uh, Nicholas Carr, I think he, actually I believe he's from GE. Yeah, he is, Gen yeah, General Electric. Uh, and um, simple infrastructure of modern business, it goes through uh, equivalent, you know, if you take um, 
the IT and consider it an in infrastructure. It's actually like the network, the telephone system, the applications, the programs, the communication, the correspondence between people, the automation of work. And if you think about it, it's kind of like an infrastructure that you get with the electrical systems, you know, like for uh, power, for railroads, for bus routes, for roads, for streets, for cars. And you think about it, without the infrastructure, you know, life would be a lot harder. <laughs> if you didn't have connectivity between all the different areas, if we didn't have airplanes, we couldn't fly to one city to another. You know, so the information technology is kind of the equivalent, and from his perspective, it's kind of the equivalent to that. Um, so that's why, you know, to answer the question, you know, why is it? You know, it does matter. Because if you throw the blanket out and you put your jewelry on it and you put a little sign up that says five dollars, two for ten, or whatever you're doing, <laughs> people in Arizona aren't going to see your sign and they're not going to walk by you while you're sitting on the Saturday afternoon at the fair selling your stuff, they're not going to see you. And what are you going to get? You're going to get whoever happened to have shown up who walked by who actually looked at your sign or looked at your jewelry or something. So you're, you're kind of giving yourself a huge disadvantage because you're working without an infrastructure, you're working without a network, uh, which is why kind of like people always, and the funny thing is, is people always equate technology with the internet. There's a lot of technology that's not on the internet actually. There's a lot of business technology that is private, that isn't a public internet kind of thing. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that further on. We'll start looking at distinctions between different types of technologies. And um, so once innovation applications of IT have become simply the cost of doing business, um, and it actually is sort of the cost of doing business, if you're going to go into business today, you have to be prepared to spend on IT. If you don't want to spend on IT, I wouldn't go into business. <laughs> and then that scares a lot of people, actually, because a lot of people, in fact, well, you can't escape it. If you're, ta if you're taking a business class these days, or business program, like an MBA program, you're going to take something in IT or IS. It's, it's a given. Otherwise, the school would be doing you injustice at the end because, you know, you're going to be afraid of it. In fact, a lot of the older managers, which is kind of good for young college grads, but the older people are afraid of technology. <laughs> they don't have, you know, old, well, this is about 10 years ago. I don't think we have any more older people <laughs> holding CIO or, or, or CEO positions that aren't technology savvy. Everybody's technology savvy. But uh, there was a time that we didn't have computers in our crib, and uh, we grew up without technology, and we got our first exposure to computers way after school. Those people were technically challenged, uh, and it took a while to get them away, or I shouldn't say get them away, to train them or have them leave uh, so they can bring in some younger blood. So a lot of the startup companies, unfortunately, are doing the exact opposite of what they should be doing. They're focusing more on the technology than they are on the business concept. Um, so it really is just like it used to be. In order to have a good idea to be an entrepreneur, you actually have to have a good business idea <laughs> with a good business plan. And then technology is a cost of doing business. It's kind of the add-on to it. A lot of startups, in fact, a lot of the whole dot-com stuff that you guys probably heard about, hopefully, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley or out here in California, the, uh, the uh, you know, opening and closing of businesses overnight. In fact, some of the stuff never even existed. Some of these businesses were like vaporware vapor products, vapor programs. Long story short, it was all on technology, and business was like a secondary kind of thing. <laughs> I was like, wow, we have this cool, cool wireless device. Let's sell it. I was like, well, who wants it? What's it used for? Well, how can we implement it? You know, why do we want it? Kind of thing. And so there was no business sense to it. Uh, so it really is the other way around. And, uh, so how important is IT to General Electric, GE? Well, it's a business imperative. It's the lifeblood of productivity. Well, according to this guy, 20% of the return on the technology investments. And uh, GE invests $2.5 to $3 billion a year. Um, there was an old case I like better than this, actually. It was uh, Morgan Stanley underinvestment in information systems. And it talked about, there's no more Morgan Stanley anymore, but 
back before the financial market collapsed in the U.S., <laughs> we actually had investment bankers, and we had a lot of them out there. We had the traditional style, and then we had the new ones that were using IT. This is right before, uh, you guys remember E-Trade? Is E-Trade still around? I think it should be. Yeah. It wasn't like a scam or anything. It was really true. But here's what happened. It's like they got smart. Most of the investment bankers said, well, the Internet, you know, if people can do, use and sell items online and do commerce, why can't they do trading? Let's bring the stock exchange to the Internet. <laughs> so E-Trade, you buy and you sell stock for yourself. Unfortunately, you know, the investment bankers, they have education in financial planning. They know, how to, they know how the stock market works. They know how to do investments wisely. So you're a 17, 18-year-old college, high school kid, <laughs> or you're a college kid, or you're young, you know, you're, and you have, you know, money that you're making from your income, and you're sticking it all, in, and you're doing all these bad choices. And you're doing all, anyway, long story short, when you take all of the, the, just the technology applied towards stock exchange, buying and selling stocks and commodities and things and, and doing investments. You take the technology, you put it in the hands of a technology savvy person, it doesn't give them a financial advisor background. It doesn't teach them about finance. <laughs> it teaches them how to click and press buttons to buy and sell. Anyway, long story short, a lot of people lost a lot of money, a lot of company, you know, a lot of a lot of bad bad investments. Uh, and that was kind of like the end of the dot-com boom, or bust, I should say, around here. But the reason why I brought that example up was com companies like Morgan Stanley back when, you know, things were pretty bad in the economy. And uh, what ends up happening is the first time anything ever goes bad in the economy, who gets laid off? The IS people. <laughs> you know, what are those information systems people do anyway? They just sit around and they spend money for the company. Because if you think about it, if you don't know anything about IST, information systems and technology, and you're, you're trying to cut business expenses because you can't make your payroll, because your sales are down, because the economy sucks. When are you going to lay off? The people who aren't leading to the bottom line, usually. So a lot of people actually got rid of information systems, technology people. You know, who needs those technical guys working on the computers all day? And a company like Morgan Stanley did that. And uh, in the meantime, their competitors uh, kept them, didn't lay off the IT staff. And anyway, this was right, right in the beginning of the internet and e-trading, and the whole. And then all these financial companies ended up with websites where customers could log in and manage their portfolio, see what their financial advisor was doing, make recommendations, and maybe if they wanted to trade themselves. You know, go ahead and. Take it and take their stab at you know play around with buying and selling stuff. And uh, you know a company that doesn't do this <laughs> is going to fall behind. You know it's going to be well you know it can't be competitive. You're not providing that service anymore. You know you didn't provide it at all. And anyway it makes the company not as competitive as everybody else out there. And so long story short the company pretty much it cost them a lot of money. They lost a lot of customers. Everybody moved to the to the new company, you know, to the companies that were adding these services that offered this. Um, actually, credit card companies kind of did that for a while too. Banks started doing stuff like that. Like if they didn't, if you couldn't do e-banking, you know, people would move. Now everybody does e-banking. Now everybody, every financial company will have something where you can log in online and look at your account, see how much money you're making, you know, um, print some reports out, print out tax forms and stuff like that. Uh, which is basically what, what I would consider, you know, an expected service. But a lot of these expected stuff never used to be. I mean, it was like somebody did it for a competitive advantage in the beginning. Hello. All right, so uh, getting back to this case study, you know, today's main risk is not, is not under using IT, but overspending on it. Um, which actually brings up a, another good example, meaning... So we know we have to invest in information systems and technology. We can't lay these people off <laughs> when we start doing bad. In fact, what we should be doing is, is the exact opposite. We should be looking at these people going, all right, guys, our business is failing. We're not making any more sales anymore. Um, our sales, everything's down. Nobody likes our product anymore. Help us. Do something for us. Because that's, that's what these guys do for a living. 
I mean, if you think they're all technology gurus, that's not right. <laughs> they are sitting around trying to figure out how to make the company more successful using technology and information systems. So they'll probably, hopefully, come back with a good suggestion, like maybe we should provide this service. Maybe we should automate this process. Maybe we should move our manufacturing to a computer automated manufacturing facility. Or I don't know what they're going to come up with. It depends on the type of business. Here's what has happened, however, and the focus of this particular case study from GE was now companies just say, okay, we understand we need to spend money on technology. So then they go out and they overspend, they buy everything. Oh, look, we have wireless networks. Oh, let's put one in. Well, we already have a wired network. What do we need a wireless one for? You know, oh, look, we got 3G. Let's, let's upgrade. It's kind of like how companies get consumers to upgrade. They say, you know, now you need Uverse. Now, you, well, I don't even know what Uverse is, actually. I don't, I mean, why do I need this? I don't have it, actually. I have basic cable. But that's a cable company or service, I guess. Anyway, Comcast, I guess. I don't know. Long story short, uh, those companies that hire managers who aren't IT, IS savvy, who don't know any better, rely upon consultants who show up, kind of like door-to-door -door salespeople, and they sell them a bunch of stuff. In fact, for a while, IT consulting was really good. <laughs> In fact, it still sort of is. IT consultants make a lot of money because they go in convincing everybody that they need to buy this. It's kind of like the, you know, the curvy vacuum cleaner, the door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner salespeople. And you may not be familiar with the example. It's kind of an old-fashioned example from the old days. You see it on TV and comedy shows a lot. Uh, long story short, everyone bought a vacuum. <laughs> High-powered industrial strength vacuum. Whether you really needed it or not, I don't know, because you like the salesperson. I don't know, they were really friendly. I don't know, so. All right, so yeah, people, it's a common problem overspending, and then they blame it on the IT. Well, we bought all this stuff, and now it's sitting over here in the you know, computer cabinet, <laughs> and it's not doing anything because <laughs> we're not using it. I always like the situations in which people go out and they buy a lot of people soft. SAP software, they put in these extremely complicated analysis programs, and nobody in the company has ever even heard of SAP, <laughs> or they're not people soft people. So then what ends up happening is this company actually has to go out and hire new people to come in and train the old people on how to use the people soft program. <laughs> and these are very complex utilities. Uh, in fact, if you get an opportunity, I think we actually have SAP classes here. Not a bad idea, actually, because nobody knows anything about it, and it's installed everywhere because every company is overspent on it, and nobody uses it. It gets totally underutilized, so they're always you know, trying to figure out, well, we have this. Why don't we make some use out of it? It's kind of like what you do when you say, well, I bought this computer, and it has a video screen, and it has a camera and a microphone, and it has all this stuff on it, but I've never used any of it. Maybe I should make a YouTube video or something. You know? I don't know. Sometimes people and companies think the same that way. Who knows? Another example is that Dell Computer. Uh, Michael Dell, who uh, used to be, probably still is CEO of Dell Computers. Anyway, anything in business can be either a sinkhole or a competitive advantage from his perspective. And these are quotes. These are things on these slides that, as I go through, I forgot to mention, are things that these people have said that have some significance because they have a really good meaning associated with you know, whatever they said was actually turned out to be true. And they may not have said this recently. It may have been mentioned a long time ago. Um, but in terms of a competitive advantage, if you, uh, if you do it really, really bad or if you do it really, really well, you know, it could be a sinkhole or it could be a competitive advantage. A classic example of that is when you start putting in automation. Um, in fact, a lot of companies love to put in brand new programs and procedures. Monday morning, the customer service people come in, they turn their computers on, and they go, what? <laughs> what is this? You've swapped out my, my program. You've, I have a new login. I have everything's upgraded, but they don't know how to use it. So the company spent a lot of money on something that, and they failed to train the people. They failed to even get the, the end user's perspective on it. Like, do we actually even need this? Because maybe they automated something that didn't really need to be automated, and there was something else that they probably could have automated instead that would have been a better benefit. 
You see that when you see multiple programs of the same type. Like you walk in and you see, well, we have five programs that do the same thing. <laughs> some people use that one. Some people use that one. Not everybody uses the same program. Not all the salespeople are processing the orders the same way. And this one poor soul, she's got five screens ahead of her, in front of her, and she's typing in this one, printing out from this one, and doing this one, and you look at that and go, whoa. It's like a lot of spending, and it actually made her slower than if you just took all that stuff out. But if you put it in correctly, it would have made her faster. So essentially, that's what he's getting at in terms of either it could be a sinkhole or a competitive advantage. In fact, it's usually one way or the other, if you haven't noticed. There are hardly very many investments in IT that don't show any effect at all <laughs> if you're actually using it. So if you're using it and it's good, it's going to be really good. If it's bad, it's going to be really bad. <laughs> There's nothing in the middle. I don't know why. And if it's really bad, you just take it out. You don't use it at all. Uh, which is why a lot of companies have a lot of old server systems, a lot of old programs, a lot of stuff, a lot of junk sitting around that they have never even used or wanted to use. So, and maybe they just implemented it incorrectly. Hmm. And his last kind of statement there, you got a lot of people who don't know what they're doing and don't do it very well. <laughs> that goes back to what I said about uh, management philosophy of uh, work and delegating tasks and standardizing work. If you actually use information systems and technology to make people conform to a certain work process, they can't do it any other way. In order to complete the sales order, they have to get the, address, the correct address. They have to get all of the necessary information. Otherwise, it won't print. Or otherwise, the sale won't go through or something like that. And you can't take a credit card number without the three-digit code on the back of the card or something like that. Or, yeah, all the pieces are there. And uh, here's another guy from uh, the first case study. And this case study actually comes out of the book that I mentioned on slide number two, if you're interested in looking that up. Because sometimes it actually is helpful to actually read what the case. I'm not going to go through. It would take me an hour just to summarize this case. But it goes through a bunch of different scenarios in terms of comparing, you know, does every, is everybody inconsistent? All these CIOs and CEOs, are they consistent with what their views are in terms of it? Does it matter? Can we get do without information systems? And um, so commercial transactions processing in the United States, some part of Europe reaches, what does that say, maturation? It becomes mature, but that's only one segment of IT, and which is a kind of a good point in terms of what this guy was thinking of, in terms of if you just think about information technology or systems in terms of e-commerce or transaction processing, great. And it's really mature. In fact, I think we've done a really good job, personally, I, I can say. I think what, from what I've seen out there, you know, we've got that down pretty good. <laughs> we've got shopping carts, we've got credit card processing, we've got everything going well. But that's only one part of it. We can't stop at that point. And it doesn't make any sense. This is the another route, going back to disadvantages. <laughs> this is another route that a lot of companies make. Is they, they take something that's already working well, and they try to improve it even more. And I'm thinking, why? If it's... When I say, if it's, don't, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Which kind of applies to information technology as well. Fix something that's broken. Why do we, why do we have a new version of everything every, every year when we don't need it? Kind of thing. So it gets to a certain point where upgrading doesn't even make any sense. Even for a personal computer user. If you have an operating system like XP, <laughs> I never upgraded the Vista. It worked just fine for me. It's still working. Just I'm still using the same XP system that I used before Vista came out. Why do I need to upgrade to Vista? I don't know. I might actually eventually upgrade to 7 because it's compatible with XP. So. But if it's not broken, don't fix it is my point. In fact, I, you know, I hated it for a while. You couldn't buy a computer that didn't have Vista on it. So now I'm kind of glad that's gone. But uh, Companies do the same thing. You know, they got this for, and then they put in a version that's worse than the previous one. It's like, what? That, that was a nice investment in information technology. Okay, good. Good spending. Okay, so um, a bunch of networks, a bunch of computers, or hardware plus software that mediates and manages human knowledge of information. Well, this kind of, this point uh, that the guy's trying to make is kind of going along the lines of, do you put in a bunch of stuff, or do you put in something that actually is going to be collecting data 
managing it, creating knowledge, actually working as an information system. And that goes back to like, you know, what is really an information system? There's a ton of applications out there and a company can actually invest in tons of these applications and programs and things, but are they really implementing an information system? Depends on what they're using the application for. And it depends on whether or not they're actually collecting the right data and managing the right data correctly and actually producing the correct information. I mean, you can keep track, and this is the interesting thing is, you know, everybody kept asking for zip codes. It was just kind of funny. Because this kind of goes back to, and I always think of the example of like the Starbucks. You know, why, why would a company ask for a zip code when you're making a sale? You know, you take the effort, and it, you know, it costs like a second or 30 seconds or maybe a minute for some people who get distracted to collect this information. <clears throat> when you're talking about dollars and cents, you know, the person's not processing as many people through the line as quickly if they have to stop and ask a question, what zip code are you from? and then take the time to enter it in. If you're going to ask for it, use it. Which is kind of interesting because a lot of companies, are, oh, everyone's asking for zip code. Oh, what's your zip code? Yeah. And a lot of people just, you know, either the information was in a, captured into the register, it wasn't even recorded, I don't know what they were doing with it, writing it down on the list. Long story short, you would do that if you, let's say, wanted to strategize a new location. Let's say you wanted to open up another Target store <laughs> or something. And then you'd find out, well, where are you coming from? and find out, oh, they're all coming from there. That's like 20 miles away. Okay, so we need to open up a store over there. Or like in the Starbucks case, we're trying to figure out what, close, what store to close, because we got too many locations. You know, we'll see, if you're coming, you know, you'll, you'll travel a little bit longer to come to this store versus that store. But there's a lot of companies that take a lot of information, and I, you know, I really didn't, personally didn't enjoy having to give out my social security number. You guys don't have to do that anymore because the American population has trained most businesses that it's not socially acceptable to ask for a social security number <laughs> because that's private information that we don't want to give out. Uh, but for a long time, companies were storing social security. Oh, yeah, what's your name, your address, your you're trying to buy something, and your social security number? And you're like, well, what do I have to give you my social security number for? Oh, we're just asking for it. You know, they take all this stuff in, and it's like, well, what are you doing with it? Half the time they didn't do anything with it, which is good. The other time, I, who knows, they're probably selling it to internet scammers. I don't know. <laughs> Identity theft people. <laughs> Long story short, going back to this slide. <laughs> you uh, are actually going to collect it, do something with it. If you're going to put in a network, actually make it a network. It doesn't make any sense to implement the technology, collect the data, if you're not using it for anything. It's a waste of time, actually doesn't add anything to anything. Just because the neighbors are doing it doesn't necessarily mean you should be doing it. So anyway. But a lot of people just a lot of companies just do something because other companies do it. So anyway. Here's another one, the last part of it, the general uh, general manager. Um, we've got uh, Microsoft, hmm, the source of competitive advantage in the business is what you do with the information that technology gives you access to. Well, actually, I just kind of covered that point, actually. <laughs> so this, this, he, he and the other guy were kind of on the same. In fact, everybody in this case study is basically saying, yeah, you know, does it matter? Yes, is the answer to that question. How do you apply it to a business problem? Um, in terms of this guy here, he was a former CIO, chief information officer for General Foods, Xerox, Pentagon, NASA. And uh, information technology today is a knowledge capital issue. And um, actually, that's a pretty good point. And this guy, his contribution to this entire case study was more like it's capital. It's kind of like how business actually, in fact, modern day businesses in terms of competitive, is going back to competitive advantages, which is how I started out this lecture to begin with. And, um, you know, we were thinking traditionally a business has got like good faith. You know, and that's a dollar value we're putting on because we have customers <laughs> or because people like us. I would say Microsoft would probably have a good value on good faith. And it's intangible. It's, it's, it's just a, it actually doesn't exist. But we have, you know, accounting people know this for sure. You have this when you're trying to sell the company, right? Well, now information and knowledge has a value to it. And that becomes part of the sale. So you might not necessarily have good faith, but maybe you have a huge database 
of knowledge. Maybe you have the know-how. And a classic example of that is Apple. So Apple would have good faith, you would have customer base, would have people, but they also have some extremely nice industrial design and engineering uh, people. And they have knowledge. They know how to put something out that people are going to like. And they have the ability to kind of generate new product after new product. I mean, how many more iPods can this world take? <laughs> but every year, every six months, and then people buy them over and over again. The average iPod pers owner has more than one. I don't know exactly. I mean, I can personally say I have about four, but, and they're all of different generations. And I haven't gotten rid of any of my old ones. I probably should. I probably should go out on eBay. <laughs> but long story short, that adds capital. It adds value to the company, gives the company a bigger, bigger sticker price when they're sold, if they're ever sold, which I seriously doubt they'll ever be sold as a company. They'll probably end up buying other people in the future, but they don't really need to. They're kind of an island of their own anyway. Sort of like a Microsoft and an Apple. You know, as a big company, that actually adds value. Well, there's smaller companies. Take, for example, PayPal or eBay or some. They have the knowledge of how to put the systems together, how to actually function. It's not a product knowledge. It's not a, you know, how to, because products come and go. In fact, if you haven't noticed, anything that comes out is duplicated and usually imported in from, the, <laughs> from China. You know, here it is. It's not the not same quality, but it looks like the same, it looks like the same mouse. You know how many mice actually, this, I went out uh, the other day looking for a new, mo new mouse, or this mice, mouse, whatever, for my computer. And I was shocked. I'm like, oh my, there, there's like 20 different selections, and they're all the same mouse. And they're all made out of different c colors of plastic. And they all have the same, they all use the same battery. They, they all use the same components, essentially. So there's no knowledge in that, if you think about it. And if you're trying to start a company up, and you're trying to gain knowledge and you're trying to add as a capital investment, you need to actually kind of think outside of the box of the product. So it's got to be a, comp a core competency, something that the company is actually good at, or it's got to be information that you're collecting, <coughs> or things that you've learned or knowledge that you've gained as a company. And it actually is a sellable item, <coughs> intangible, just like good faith. It's a tangible, sellable item, which it hasn't been since the last maybe 10 years or so that that's actually seen as an asset. Um, I don't know if people put it on their books. I'm not an accounting person, but uh, I've definitely say it does add value. So, and uh, looking at business powers, most of the WalMarts, yeah, whatever, FedEx. <laughs> so, they're all waging information warfare. Actually, Walmart's a pretty interesting company. <laughs> I don't know how they do it. But well, you can walk into a Walmart, and you are, I don't even have to say anything about Walmart. All you guys are looking at me like, yeah, we've been to Walmart. Everybody in this world has been to a Walmart, no matter where you've been, no matter how much money you have. You've been to a Walmart. <laughs> and then when you've gone to the Walmart, you've always, you, why do you go there? Because it's cheap. So the company already has this knowledge, it already has this image that is cheap. And then I'm thinking, well, how, the, how are they able to do it? Because there's, all right, Walmart, there's Targets, Kmarts. So, you know, Costco. Actually, Costco I put in a different category. I don't put them in the Walmart category. Costco I put into the, we have, it's an overstock.com. You've ever heard of that company? It's like, we have too many of this product, send it to Costco. <laughs> Discontinued product, send it to Costco. <laughs> Consumers will just buy it in volume. Or it's like we have big packages of stuff. You know, your supply of toilet paper you can buy at Costco in one, one visit. So I don't know. But I kind of see different. But Walmart, though, has some pretty good prices, actually, not to sell Walmart or to promote Walmart. But um, I go there myself, I actually like it. You, know, you can buy almost anything there. It's cheap. So. And I find it, you know, sometimes cheaper than Target, but, you know, as a Savvy computer, a, a consumer, I also go to Target as well, you know, occasionally, because there's one close to my house. Walmart's farther away. But Walmart has a, actually has a really good strategy. If you haven't noticed, all the Walmarts are within a freeway exit, like a certain mile, like less than a mile from a freeway exit <laughs> all over the United States. Like, 
because they want to catch you. They want to make you accessible to freeways. So they're not in neighborhoods. They're not in malls. They're in free, off of, right off of freeway exits. So. All right, so the, uh, this next part, slide number 15 and slide number 16, gets into some concepts and some questions. And these are the questions that are actually presented at the end of the text of the particular case study, which we didn't actually go over. And I'm not going to actually go over these questions. Instead, you can download this lecture number two for those people who walked in late, downloadable from the website. Um, it's not an assignment for this particular class. Um, but I put it in here just to kind of, it's food for thought questions that you could ask yourself. And I'll just go over the first one. You know, do you agree, essentially, with the argument made? And uh, do you support his position? Because IT no longer gives companies a competitive advantage. It's just needed to survive. So there's a lot of different perspectives on it. If we wanted to sit here and discuss it, we could discuss it longer and longer and longer. But um, for you guys, I'm going to save you the torture. <laughs> In some business classes, you know, actually there's audience participation. I find you guys don't want to talk. Or if you do want to talk, it's in the corner in the back, and I have to yell over you because I can't, nobody can hear me because <laughs> you're making too much noise. <laughs> no, I shouldn't be like that. But anyway, um, eh, read, read through them if you want. You don't have to. It's not required material for this course. So. All right, strategic information systems by definition. We're looking at any kind of information system that uses information technology to help an organization gain a competitive advantage, reduce a competitive disadvantage, or meet other strategic enterprise objectives. I can read. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you can too. <laughs> so. um, but I thought it was important to actually take note. Um, that's the definition I've been talking about since the beginning of this lecture. <laughs> so, um, that's what's meant by a strategic information system. To apply the technology part of it, we're applying technology to that. We can't have information technology without information systems or information. So, because half of you probably, maybe some of you were thinking in the beginning, this is coming from a management information systems text. Yes, it's all in the same. <laughs> so information technology is a subcomponent of it. So we have the mission and the competitive strategies to look at in terms of a definition. And we have the corporate mission or the objective. So in, in my MIS introduction course, I spent a couple weeks and I talked about strategy formation in terms of information systems. If you took that class, some of you probably didn't. I'm not going to repeat all that stuff. But what I will say is that most IT implementations are strategy based. In fact, we're going to find IS also strategy-based. And um, because the point is, you've got to have a business advantage. You've got to have some reason, some reasoning to actually do the implementation. Otherwise, it is, going back to it, it's a waste of money. It's, it's a sinkhole, essentially. Um, so. so the competitive strategy, by definition, major policies, basically supporting uh, the company to compete with other companies to survive in the long run. Um, could be strategies to make improvements, strategies to put new products in place. You think about the word strategize, or strategy, can apply to almost any concept within the business. So. And here, are, um, probably can see that. Actually, some of you in the back probably can't see that, the details of the bottom. I'm not going to, you can download slide, slide, slide number 19 if you write that down. Competitive forces and strategies, what this is actually showing you is one of them is going in one direction. You probably can see the arrows, hopefully. we got arrows going up, and we've got arrows going to the right or left, depending upon where you're sitting and standing. Actually, if you look at it head on, it's going to the right. And uh, it's competing, competing forces that are working against each other, and which is kind of like, you know, outside of the field of information systems and technology. It's kind of relevant. I mean, it's basically the same thing you're familiar with with other business concepts. Not everybody is working on the same page. <laughs> so. On the competitive strategies, and then we have the forces. On the, uh, the arrows going horizontal, we've got uh, cost, leadership, differentiation, innovation, growth, alliance. And then uh, on the other side, the forces. We've got uh, some com com competitive rivalry, uh, excuse me, threats of new entrants. I don't know, we've got bargaining power, bargaining power suppliers of consumers. You know, it's kind of like how we can put a product out, but then we're also going to have people who are trying to find a better price, who are 
you know, going back to the disadvantages of information technology, if we put something out for sale, a lot of people do this actually. There's web, there's data mining web applications that go out and find what is something selling for? <laughs> well, I have to put it out if I want to sell it. I got a list of price. Somebody else is going to take a look at that and five minutes later going to go, go one cent lower than me. So if I get a program that's going out looking for the best price, I'm going to always come up first if I'm a penny cheaper. What's it going to cost me a penny? <laughs> so there's pricing strategies to kind of, and then there's dynamic pricing. You know, that's, that basically takes a look at what everybody else is selling something for. It kind of fits right in. So if you haven't noticed, like, even if it's like an on-off, like, cents, like $19.57, <laughs> everybody will have it for $19.57. You know, where did that 57 cents come from? It's because somebody went, like, 52, 53 cents. So if my product is $19.50, 49 cents, or something like that, you know, I might show up first in the search engine, or first in the, uh, because I'm a couple cents cheaper, which, I don't know, it's a strategy, a good strategy example to show you how you can price something out there and then your competition can actually kind of beat you out. It's a strategy by looking at your price. In terms of a definition of what would be considered a competitive force, shape and structure of the competition in the industry, competition can actually come from almost anything. In fact, there's technology competitions these days. <laughs> So it's no longer product, features, pricing. There's also technology. Are we 3G? Are we 2G? Do we want, are we really 2G, but we want to call ourselves 3G? You know, stuff like that comes into play. And then we have Porter's competitive forces model. This guy was actually out of the text. And if you were in my MIS class, I went over the Porter's model. Um, he actually looks at, in terms of, in the top paragraph right before the bullet points kind of explains you know, to survive and succeed, uh, you must have to meet, develop, implement strategies to be effective and counter these particular things. And this is a basically summary of this particular chart right here. Um, so number 19 is the pictorial ver version of the graph. The picture of slide number 21, which is essentially going through the same thing, showing you that these things are going to be in direct competition with each other and these features, I'm not going to go through them again. You can go ahead and read the slide on your own um, and, uh, you know, probably get a better feel for it, actually, better. So. In terms of competitive strategy, this is the other, this is the other uh, axis of that particular chart. So it's really that slide. Number 21 and 22 go together with, uh, I think it was slide 19, the picture. I'm kind of giving a little bit more detail about that. So, the purposes of this lecture, mm, you guys probably already know the forces and things of that nature at this point. So, um, to tell you a little bit, and I'll kind of thumb through this kind of quickly to say that the competitive strategies fall into these particular categories, not set in stone. In fact, if you were doing your own analysis, you'd probably come up with different categories. Um, some of these might be the basic ones. I mean, you've got to look at, as an example, cost leadership strategies. Do you want to have the cheapest price? Um, in fact, it may not necessarily be that. You know, becoming the low-priced producer of the product or the service may not necessarily want to be your goal. If you think about Apple as a company, their iPods are not low-priced compared to other MP3 players out there. In fact, if anything, they make themselves more expensive and sometimes on purpose. <laughs> because you know, it adds value, perceived value to the product. Why do you want a $1.99 iPod? You know, I want to pay $199 for that iPod. Now, why would you want to put a Mac MacBook for under $1,000? Know, actually, they have one now. It's under $1,000, but for a while, they've always been over $1,000. Because, you know, that perceived price quality. But people still buy them, so that ne it's not necessarily their problem. Because if you think about it, there's nobody else to compete with. There are no other iPods out there. So. And an iPod isn't an MP3 player. Well, and not in everybody's minds. So. For the people that don't own them, perhaps. I don't know. Anyway, I'm not trying to sell iPods either. So. <laughs> I think, you know, sometimes I think, like, what am I selling today? <laughs> All right, finding ways to help suppliers and customers reduce their costs. Well, that's actually probably a global concept. Even if you're selling a high priced item, you still don't want to pay a high price for your supplies. You know, you want to make more profit, hopefully. Yeah. Increase cost of 
maybe the increased cost of competitors. In fact, you see this. Um, in terms of information systems technology strategies, back when people started going global, people said, we can buy those parts in China directly from the manufacturer and we can get a reduced price. And we're going to have an exclusive trade agreement with these guys so that our competitors have to buy it from the U.S. importers, but we can buy it directly. So in the beginning, a lot of that strategy stuff was going on. And if we had the IT support for that, we can actually get in touch with through our supply chain management programs or something, some direct distribution overseas instead of having to be limited in terms of the market that we were seeing. And the information technology built the networks, built the, built the communication that we could use between the parties. So, Differentiation strategy, how are we different than everybody else out there? You can use information technology to do that, actually. You can be selling the same identical product, but be different. <laughs> You see this in the clothing market all the time. You see, but they have a different, it's a non-IT strategy. You know, there's a good reason why there's displays in stores. How do you get a display on the internet, though? That's the one I have yet to see actually implemented correctly. So you walk into a department store, and you see, I use it like Old Navy, whatever. You guys are familiar with it. You see the mannequin all dressed up with an outfit. <laughs> And you could buy, you know, the shirt, you could buy the pants and the hat. And stuff. You could buy the whole thing, right? Because that's why they're doing it, to show you how to put things together, how it looks. And then certain stores have a different image. So if you go into a Calvin Klein store, <laughs> it's going to look different. You know, these people are going to look like business executives. The mannequins are going to look like business executives. Or maybe not. I don't know what they're going to look like. I don't shop over there. But they're going to look different than the old Navy mannequins that are going to look like they just stepped off the beach. Or maybe they're going to the beach. Or maybe they're playing basketball or something. Um, it's the image that differentiates. It's a shirt over here. It's a shirt over here. They're both shirts. <laughs> but they have different perceived images, different perceived qualities, different wear, different usage. It's the same thing. It's a shirt. How do you get that on the Internet, which is interesting. So I've yet to actually see, maybe this will happen in the future, or maybe one of you guys will dream up the concept, a good example of how to use information systems and technology <laughs> to put together a way of advertising a product to get the equivalent image that you would get if you were looking at a mannequin in a store. What do we see on the internet? We see pictures. <laughs> you know, it's usually kind of laid out, like from the, in fact, half of it comes from the manufacturer or whoever is making this, or, you know, like they took a picture and it's like this a shirt that's all stretched out, or maybe it's on somebody and they're wearing it. But, I don't think the same thing comes over. I don't think that whole concept translates correctly. Because especially if you go to the mall and you walk in it, you hear music. Sometimes they give you, you know, free, free lollipop or something. I don't know, during the Christmas time. And they have all this other stuff going on. You know? <laughs> it's like a three-dimensional you know, experience. It's like you're going to a nightclub when you go to these shopping malls. You know, and you go into the stores. You can't get that from a static HTML page. So a lot of people are adding flash, they're adding images, sound. Well, actually, I hate sound. Sound's going away. I hate the sound off. But really, what is it? It's just a, it's just the life experience translated in the technology. It's almost it's trying to do the same thing. I don't really think it's that effective, personally. I don't know. I mean, I think it's okay for now. But I'm thinking in the future, we're probably going to get something different. Hopefully, something that's more suited for that environment, perhaps. I don't know, it would make perfect sense to me. So. All right, but differentiation, selling the same product, looking the same, looking different, and uh, reducing the differentiation advantages of competitors as well. So innovative strategies, being innovative, developing unique products and services, how many more of some product can we actually put out on the market um, in terms of what it is we're trying to accomplish. Um, enter into unique markets and market niches. Well, that's what the internet did for everybody. So the internet allowed us to sell globally. So we could essentially, um, you know, reach everybody. So going back to the example in the beginning when we laid out our little blanket, we put our jewelry on it. <laughs> We're just getting those people that are walking by. Yeah, put it on the internet, and you get people all over the world buying your product. And actually, believe it or not. There's some products that don't sell in the U.S. that sell elsewhere, and vice versa. There's some th things that won't sell in California that will sell in Colorado or somewhere else. So, 
internet's got a lot of advantages to it and radical changes stuff like that so. growth strategies and I think um, eh, I think I'm well we'll give it another 15 20 can you guys make it that long <laughs> are you guys anxious <laughs> I will warn you ahead of time I never break so if you do have to go to the bathroom answer a cell phone or something go out come back in you're not gonna offend me the other thing also is make sure you put your name on the roster that's going around if you came in later so. all right um, we are gonna wrap up though within about 15 20 minutes or so because I want to get at least through the different strategies so, like that. so it's a good stopping point um, all right <coughs> growth strategy implementing uh, information technology to actually provide some growth for the company doesn't always work it's kind of like the sinkhole effects. You could, uh, let's say, we want to we wanna be the number one MP3 player in the world. And we're competing with Apple. <laughs> I don't think there's anyone out there who is, I was going to use the word stupid, but I don't know if that's really a good word to use, although I just said it. I don't know if there's anyone who's crazy enough to compete with them. I don't think you're going to compete with Microsoft. You're not going to put, you're not going to put a brand new operating system on the market. Sorry. <laughs> and you're not going to make an MP3 player. You might actually come out with a new computer. And if you go into Fry's and you take a look, you'll see everybody has got all these, you know, now it's blue and pink and it's thin and it's, you know, it, it looks like a Mac, but it isn't a Mac. It's small, you know. You can do that, but you can't use technology in all cases. And that's actually not even technology. To make a blue or pink computer instead of a black one isn't it really technology. <laughs> it's uh, manufacturing. I don't know. It's color choices. But you can actually use technology to implement growth by, well, in the previous example, growing the market, finding customers that you wouldn't have normally sold to. Uh, but you may also be able to cross over into different segments. As an example, you're a, you know, a Maybe you're a headphone maker. Maybe you make really good headphones. Um, maybe you could switch, use technology to, uh, I don't know, hit, hit a market that's different. So for example, um, maybe you're Bluetooth. Maybe you can make headphones that work with, because, you know, people like to wear those things around, even though, and they, like, they talk, um, you know, like for cell phones, hands-free cell phones, you know. Actually, I'm so glad it's going away, but for a while, Everyone looked like robots. They had these little things in their ears. Well, Americans did. They had a little thing in their ear with a blue light or a yellow light or green light. And they looked like robots. They'd be walking around, and, oh, yeah, talking to themselves. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, in restaurants, down the aisle of the supermarket. And you're like, oh, is that person crazy? They're yelling at themselves, you know. Anyway, if you can make that, you know, let's say, for example, use technology to make that work with everything, you know. So you can, you know, voice activation for your car start turn radio on or something, you know. If you're going to wear it constantly, you know, maybe make it multifunctional if it's part of your body. But I'm, I'm glad people are starting to take those things off. Because actually when cell phones first came out, Americans used to wear them on their hips, on their belt clips. And, you know, it was a to total tangent. But at one point I saw some person that had like three of them you know, like on a belt. You're wondering, it's like, it's like a tool belt or something. <laughs> got these cell phones hanging out. Now you never see that. You don't see anyone with a cell phone. Because now they're so small, they fit in your pocket, actually. Now instead, you see the big, big pockets with the, well, in the old days, it used to be wallets. Now it's cell phones and iPhones and stuff. So. Anyway, long story short, I don't even know why I brought that up, but I think it was to give you an example of how to cross-sell, perhaps, with the earphones. But... You're seeing a lot more multifunctional devices, earphones that work with handsets, that work with remote controls. In fact, you know, the universal remote control item. Um, but uh, in order to grow the product, you can use information technology to kind of maybe cross over into different markets. People that would not have normally bought your products. You know, instead of looking out, instead of branching out the global um, market to attract new customers you wouldn't have attracted before, the concept is using technology to get people who would not normally use your product to use your product. I mean, why do you need these, air, why, do, why do you need these earphones for something, you know? Use it for something else, kind of thing, so. And you see this all the time when you start seeing, you know, cross-selling, up-selling, 
um, of different products and strategies. So, Expanding into global markets, diversifying new products, new services, integrating new products and services. Actually, um, there was this thing for a new product, or actually it was a service that hasn't been out for too long, but the carriers. So instead of sending something FedEx overnight, it's within the city. You send a courier, carrier, who's on a bicycle, like a messenger, who just is kind of like the same price these days now, actually. Physically carries it over on a bicycle instead of putting it on a truck. So it's just a different product. Alliance strategies, establishing new business linkages and alliance with customers, suppliers, competitors, consultants, and companies. When I look at this, I see supply chain management <laughs> and huge supply chain management programs. If you were in my MIS class, I talked about supply chain management. And as a concept, if you actually have a internet, or even if it's, you have a gateway to the internet on it, you have a program supply chain management software program established, maybe part of an ERP system, and you've got a listing of everything you need, then rather than going out to attract suppliers, you can have suppliers come in. So you just stand there and wait for people to show up <laughs> and give you a price quote to say, hey, I need, uh, and especially if it's common parts that are used in your manufacturing that um, you know, other people might be using as well, like a commodity. They can come in and say, well, I can deliver you 2,000 of these nails at this price, and I can have them to you by Tuesday or something. And then somebody else says, oh, no, I'll cut you three, three cents on it, you know, but it's going to be two weeks before I can deliver it. And then you can actually post plan out production schedules so that you have part lists. And so what ends up happening is kind of like the eBay of supply chain where people who have product to sell, people who have product to buy, who want to buy product, all get together electronically without any humans involved. And they all do their exchanges. You can have it publicly, you can have it privately, you can invite certain suppliers to come into the system. Let's say you're dealing with the same supplier over and over again. You don't want to, every month, you know, you're building your NUMI and you're building these cars. Every month, you know, you're going to need, well, you know, we don't have NUMI anymore. Bad example, but. <laughs> Imagine we still have new me around here. Um, you're building, and you, you're going to need, you know, on a regular basis. But you don't know exactly how many you need. You don't know how many, what, what cars are going through the line, what supplies you're going to need, how much paint, how much, you know, whatever it is going to need as a, as a part of this manufacturing project. If you put the schedule into the system, and then the suppliers know exactly what you need, and then they can supply you with exactly what you need. So it shows up exactly when you need it. Instead of having a warehouse full of parts, which we all know from just in time, you know, it's useless. It's a waste of money. We can actually cut that. Not only does it make a huge improvement upon the just in time concept, it uses information systems and technology to streamline the entire process. Now you don't have a staff of people sitting there ordering, sitting there getting pieces and parts and things ready for manufacturing, it's already done for you automatically through agreements that you have with people who are all sharing the same software, same information. And it's really an information exchange, actually. I wish I could do that with groceries. <laughs> yeah, why would we have to go to the groceries? Stuff could just, you know, actually somebody had this concept. It was like web van or something, or I don't know. But you had to order it. So if I had a computer application that could look at my refrigerator and say, oh, yeah, I need vitamin water. Okay. <laughs> and just fill it up when I need it. That would be great. So essentially that's what's happening in these businesses these days. Supply chain management is one of them. Enterprise resource planning is another kind of system that's used on a large scale that brings people together, creates an enterprise out of the organization. And if you're not familiar with that concept, it's the enterprise is the company the suppliers, the customers, the distributors, is everybody who's working with the company all in one, all working together through technology to get everything done, saves people, saves work, makes things run faster, gets you better pricing, makes you more competitive, but it's extremely difficult to understand. <laughs> and there's a lot of, been a lot of case studies with people. You know, it sounds like a great idea, right? been a lot of case studies with companies that have put in these huge ERP systems and going back to the example of you know sinkhole and did not give them a competitive advantage if anything 
it gave them a lost customers, lost, you know, slower manufacturing, more expenses, products they didn't need, parts they didn't need. There's a lot of work actually that went that goes into reorganizing not only the work tasks, but the way things are ordered, the way things are scheduled, the whole planning process of everything has to be re-engineered in order for these systems to work. A lot of companies just buy them, put them in, and nobody uses them. <laughs> and that is a waste of money. So bottom line, if you're gonna uh, if you're gonna come up with some strategy to create an alliance between your competitors or suppliers, you gotta make sure everybody's on board with it. Otherwise it does not turn into a good investment. It turns into a very, very poor investment. Um, here's some competitive strategy examples uh, to think about in terms of, and this on the left-hand side, it's kind of small, you probably can't see it in the back, but that left-hand column goes through cost, leadership, differentiation, innovation, growth, alliance, those things I just went through a few minutes ago. With some companies, with some strategies that they've implemented, and then the benefit on the far right-hand side. And if I just look at the benefits, some of them are actually not more profits. <laughs> I mean, although, you know, I have been saying, you know, we're in business to make money, hopefully. And uh, sometimes, you know, as an example, marketing, market leadership. Sometimes it actually is better for the company to be the market leader and not necessarily the most profitable. Uh, because that leadership can buy you further down the road can actually, you know, hopefully give you some long-term strength in the market. Maybe if you're the leader, uh, give you some sort of an advantage that you can take advantage of in another way. And I'll leave you with one last example associated with that. The profit margin on those particular iPods, probably not so good, actually. In fact, I would almost say that others, other iPods on the market that Hmm, probably the companies are making a bigger profit. Not, I shouldn't say iPods, MP3 players on the market where I don't know exactly what the profit margins are for any MP3 player or iPod. However, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that's not where they make their money. They don't make their money on computer sales either. In fact, I would imagine that the profit margin is lower on the computers than it is on the iPods. You know where they make their money? <laughs> iTunes. You know why they put that in? Because people bought iPods, right? And what do you do with an iPod if there's no iTunes? <laughs> so they got this great idea. And if you're around enough, if you're around long enough to, ver to experience the first version of iTunes that was only available on a Mac, it wasn't even on a XP, it wasn't even Windows compatible at that point. Very basic. Very, and you can, you know, it didn't have very much internet anything on it. It was just, download this, put this, and it actually all it did was let you take your music CDs, put them on the computer, and then put them onto the iPod. It was a way of getting the content on the iPod, because you needed a program. I think back a long time ago, you needed a program on the computer to get everything on that iPod. Well, they did this, actually, this IT investment into iTunes was to make their iPods functional. <laughs> and uh, what has it done now? It's given them market leadership. When you think of anything, you think of iTunes. Everyone's heard of iTunes. Everybody uses iTunes for everything. It's a free program. <laughs> you don't pay for iTunes, it comes free. What you're doing though is every time you download a song, you're paying $1.99, I don't know how much they are right now. They got DVDs, eBooks, MP3, everything, it's a content management system for multimedia, for entertainment, education, recorded videos for ev almost everything. Long story short, they're the market leader and they're making more money. The, the revenue that they make off of iTunes is as about as big as you can get <laughs> compared to every, and they, they make more sales through iTunes. If it wasn't for iTunes, they wouldn't be in the position that they're in right now if you think about it. I mean, who needs another computer on the market? But, you know, they're Apple, they're going to be making computers forever. And I like their computers. But that's a good, uh, that's a good example of a competitive strategy that they did within the company by accident that actually turned into one of their biggest revenue generating sources that is pretty much the support of the entire company that nobody's going to compete with anyway.
And uh, it gave them a business benefit that nobody actually ever imagined, probably. Of course, who knows? Maybe they, were, maybe they knew that ahead of time. I don't know. I can't imagine anyone sitting back in the back office going, yeah, if we put iTunes in, we can support the entire organization on that. <laughs> it's a computer program. Think about it. But it's IT, information technology. And it's an information system. And if you were in my database class, I talked about how uh, objects stored in databases, you can actually configure that entire system. So you have one copy of everything. So you're not making copyright violations or anything. You have it all stored together. It doesn't take very much space. Because you think about the concept of if you're going to manage as a company something like iTunes, you're looking at a huge database, right? Because <laughs> hopefully we're not looking at files on servers everywhere. That would not be very efficient. If it's all organized into tables and it's all it's, if it's in a database kind of format, then it's easily searchable through an SQL query, through a front-end interface from almost any platform. It's on a mobile phone, on a computer. Easy to get at, easy to search, easy to house. And it's smaller. You know, it's definitely taking advantage of other technologies to make it happen. And uh, who works on iTunes? Well, developers do. But nobody sits there and hands out songs to people. <laughs> It's all automated. It's free. There's no cost of labor. It costs the same thing to sell one song as it does to sell 2,000 of the same song. All right. Um, actually, I am going to wrap this up soon. So looking at other competitive strategies as a summary kind of the competitive strategy part of this. Locking in customers and suppliers, building valuable new relationships with them. We all know about that. Um, actually, almost every company tries to do that. To, well, why would you want to get rid of your customers? <laughs> you want to come out with something new every week, right? Hopefully. Uh, building switching costs, so the firm's customers, suppliers, um, well, being able to switch between different customers and suppliers easily without costing anything. So they are reluctant to pay the cost of the time and many effort and convenience. Wouldn't take too much to switch to the company's, uh, you know, switch to a company's competitors easily translates to uh, being flexible. In fact, IT, I didn't mention it yet, but information systems technology can actually make the company more flexible. Flexible with employees, flexible, it's used a lot in HR, actually. Everybody's heard of, hopefully, the employee self-service. <laughs> That's when you don't need any HR people. You have a door, it's usually a you know, broom closet that says HR on it. And it's hidden with a URL on the bottom of it. You, know, you go online. Oh, everything you ever needed to do. I need to call in sick. I need to, you know, I need a proof of employment. I need a, all on the website. Why do you need a person doing this? Unfortunately, it's a little impersonal. But long run, it saves them money. It saves the company a lot of money. Uh, raising the barriers to entry as well. Information technology can make it a lot easier. Uh, so it discourage or delay other companies from entering into a market. So you can actually, well, in terms of competitive strategies for raising barriers to entry, you could, uh, well, iTunes itself, Microsoft, any of those big companies, and with big product services, who's going to compete with eBay? So you can use uh, technology to make it so it's more difficult for competitors to come in on, you know, to actually copy you, to duplicate you. That's really, I mean, if you're actually doing something significant and you're doing something that's not repeatable easily and you've actually made a market impression, you've got market share, you're not easily going to be taken over. It's generally those products that weren't so good. Somebody builds a better mousetrap, as the phrase goes. You know, somebody builds a better solution. And leveraging investments as well is also important to look at. Information technology, develop new product services that would not be possible without a strong IT capability so, in terms of leveraging. So. All right, I think I'm going to end at this point because I've gotten information overload already. I don't know about you guys. But. So we're on uh, slide number 30. So the, uh, this is still lecture two, so yeah, there's actually not too many lectures for this course which is why I never cover the entire lecture in one, well, one class meeting. Instead, you're going to get over a couple of different class meetings, which probably is easier for you anyway. So, so next time, we will continue with this lecture, which is lecture two. 
and uh, I think there's about there's, we're about halfway through it and ooh, the second part of it just to give you some it's more hand it's more examples and it's more hands-on <coughs> strategy formation so what we've covered is pretty much the overview of the different competitive strategies at this point so now we're actually going to dive in a little lower level of abstraction on it as well so, any questions make sure to sign the roster that's going around and we do start at 11. I know that at one point it was posted for 1, but it's 11 a.m. So just so you know in the future. Okay, we're done. Bye. See you next time.